I'm pulling up my uh, PowerPoint right now. Um, And that is, are you able to see that now? Yes, now. And and I just wanted to let everybody know that we're going to be re recording the webinar also. Okay. Okay. So uh, my comments uh, come out of uh, some of the discussion that many of you have been having um, uh, in uh, evaluation and in retrospect of uh, the response to avian influenza over the course of the past few years. Um, low path, um, we've had that in Michigan in 2014-15. Um, we've had it this past year again. High path, of course. And then now uh, some of the discussion that's taking place with uh, the working group that's looking at larger animal uh, emergency planning uh, in composting. And so um, I, I just entitled it uh, Estimating Clean Amendment Needs in a Mass Mortality Event. Um, I tried to give it a title that captured some of the, the comments that were um, shared with me and what I was uh, asked to maybe focus on today uh, in our time. Um, so some of those comments uh, go back to um, High Path, uh, where the procuring of amendments took time. And uh, I'll say at this point, amendments, um, there's ter different terms used. And amendments is a term I've used. Um, it's the, uh, another term would be bulking agents. Uh, you'll see carbon material, carbon source uh, used. And I think some, oftentimes we use those synonymously, we exchangeably. And, um, but in some of the writings and so forth, you, you, you might see them used differently. But um, I'm gonna use the word amendment most of the time um, because uh, to me, it's, it's, it's all inclusive. It includes uh, um, not just uh, something that's fairly highly carbonaceous, but it might include something that's uh, got a lot more nitrogen like waste feed in it too, but uh, that'd be an amendment. Um, but we saw some difficulty in procuring amendments in different parts of the country. We saw that some of our rules of thumb estimates for the amount of amendment needed may have been uh, somewhat inaccurate or the amendments themselves weren't what we thought we had, and so therefore that led to inaccuracy. Uh, I think we were challenged um, by variations in litter or manure on farms, uh, whether that be uh, differences in age of birds, uh, laying versus uh, turkey, um, breeder uh, versus uh, market animals, um, and then the inclusion of the feed that remained or the grains that remained in grain bins, uh, eggs, uh, that's a, been a recent uh, discussion uh, by this group. Um, and then, of course, the concern about the amount of money that it took to procure those amendments and bring them onto farms. So um, the challenge of, uh, of determining how much uh, amendment uh, is on the farm versus, as well as how much clean amendment needs to be brought on the farm. So given that, uh, my, my kind of my question is, uh, given that the compost mixture is important for successful composting, how do we produce an acceptable mix of mortality and amendments? Uh, the mix of what we have present on the farm, uh, along with what we're bringing on um, in clean amendments. So um, the uh, composting protocol, that many of this group and others developed over the course of the last year and a half or, or longer um, has some guidelines uh, for determining that um, and they present three methods. Um, the first method is on a weight-based estimate and um, it talks about a relationship of carbon material. Uh, here that would be the word for amendment. Um, but the carbon material, about 1.5 pounds of carbon material uh, per pound of bird. And that parenthetical phrase is, is important here. It's based on a bulk density of 30 pounds per cubic foot of material, um, or 800 pounds per cubic yard. And uh, so um, that's a critical part of this understanding and and from the very beginning of this estimate 
procedure, that this challenge that we're given on these farms, um, we are introduced to a concept that runs through uh, the whole practice of mortality composting, and that is a density and a relationship of how much, and I use the word animal tissue, we have mixed with these non-animal tissue amendments or carbon sources. And so we're introduced to this relationship um, in this document right away at this point. And so we're looking at uh, one and a half pounds of carbon material um, per pound of bird. And what that relates then to is about um, if you want to look at it a different way, it, look, it, it comes out to be about 20 pounds of animal tissue per cubic foot. 20 pounds per cubic foot. Keep that in mind because that's another way of looking at this relationship. It's uh, amount of mortality per volume of uh, amendment. And so, um, and uh, so that's what that comes out to be, about 20 pounds. So keep that in the back of your head. And so then it just goes through on how to determine the amount of pounds on, uh, on the, the average bird weight, number of birds, and so forth. And then uh, determining the pounds of litter in the house, that's a key part of the, the response um, on these farms, uh, especially uh, turkeys, uh, broilers, um, how much litter is in the house. If it's a, a laying facility, it's how much uh, manure is stored in a, some type of a stacking facility on that farm. Um, and so uh, the, the amount of additional carbon, and we might say clean carbon to be brought in is the difference between what's on the farm um, and what's needed, calculated, estimated uh, to be needed uh, for this response. The second method, again, uh, is, is like that. It's based on volume. And so again, with the assumption that there's a bulk density of litter of 30 pounds per cubic foot, um, we require, as we just found out in the first slide, a 20 pound bird requires one cubic foot of carbon material. A 40 pound bird requires two feet, cubic feet of carbon material. So here again, we're focused on this animal density to volume uh, factor. Um, and it's a very key part of, of uh, our work. So um, go through the methods again to determine how much uh, clean uh, amendment would be needed. And so um, the third method is, is the computer tools that have been introduced um, previously to some of us, uh, some of you here. Um, if you've attended uh, the fifth uh, international symposium in Lancaster, um, my colleague Dean Ross uh, and I had a poster there where we talked about the emergency animal tissue compost planner. And uh, that's what I'd like to introduce you to um, first. And then I'd like to show you a little bit about the compost recipe optimizer um, to estimate amounts or proportions of amendments uh, given the availability of amendments. So, and then there's just a, a URL where you can find those tools for yourself. Uh, later when you want to look for them. Hello. Please so, the I apologize. That was my phone in the background. Um, moving forward, um, planning uh, the compost amount of clean amendment needed is um, related to the approaches we're taking. And typically on these farms, we've taken an approach of windrow um, uh, using a windrow of some type, either in the building or outside the building. Um, and the basic components of the windrow are, are seen here in this graphic, uh, where we talk about a base layer. Um, and in the uh, protocol, we, we talk about using clean material for that base layer. And then we talk about having a cap. And then uh, the heart of the pile, or uh, the center of the burrito, as has been said, is the core. And uh, so that's a, a mix of carcasses, eggs, litter, um, and the other um, potentially contaminated materials that would be on the farm. And so uh, the cap is clean material. Um, the core is where we use what's present on the farm. 
and what else we need to use in order to get that good mix of material uh, that would be effective uh, in creating a very active uh, decomposition process, um, a decontamination process uh, that we desire. So um, in our development of our tool, um, we look at and, and determine the shape of the windrow. As many of you know in responding that uh, these shapes vary um, on the farm. Uh, and in response, it varies by the type of building you might be in, if it's a turkey building, uh, the dimensions of the building, width and height, uh, the equipment that's available to operate in those buildings, uh, you might see variation. In particular, the bottom one, which is what I call the flat top windrow, um, the width of that flat top can be varied, um, and uh, again, depending on the dimensions of the building. Um, and then when you calculate uh, the, the dimensions of these wind rows and calculate volume, you realize that these slopes are not perfect. Uh, the ends are not uh, perfectly spherical, nor are they uh, uh, triangular in, in shape if you were to cut off the ends. And so you've got uh, ends that uh, impact the volume on a small amount, and typically the ends will be end up being clean material that you need to bring in um, as they, uh, are part of that cap. And so um, you can estimate the, the size of these wind rows uh, longhand uh, using various uh, geometrical formulas, or uh, like what we've sought to do in our tool is put these estimations in a spreadsheet um, where that calculation is done quickly for you. Um, and then you can get an estimate of that amendment. The cap cover envelope, um, sometimes called, um, of a, of a various pile. Um, if you could get a quick mes measurement of the arc across the pile um, and the arc, the length of the pile, um, you can visualize this as one large blanket laying over the core um, and laying over the base. And uh, you can give that uh, blanket a thickness and uh, in essence cap, uh, estimate uh, the volume of that cap. And uh, that's the, the geometry that we put into our tool and, um, uh, and, and um, provide that estimate of that volume. Um, I put this slide in here because this comes from, uh, again, the guide, and it just talks about the, the critical nature of having um, cap material, mixing, carbon, uh, moisture, um, and some of the problems and how they really are associated with this mix of materials. Um, and what I sometimes term the recipe. Um, in an emergent situ situation, sometimes uh, there's so much material that must be, in the case of litter, if it's very deep, that must be used in these situations. So our hand, so to speak, in a poker game, we're forced to use material or more of it than we might want to because um, we have that much of it. We can't bring in much more outside clean material because of space limitations. And so we encounter some of these problems, but given the opportunity to make it ideal, um, we have some tools um, uh, and we can do that um, with these tools. The key part of these is in the core. Um, and that's where um, we are challenged to make sure this mix uh, and this, uh, the material in the core um, works effectively and doesn't lead to these types of problems. So um, another concept um, that I have thought in my years of uh, composting mortality is um, whole carcasses are surrounded by a mixture of feedstocks uh, that should readily decompose or start composting alone without the nitrogen contribution of the animal tissue considered. This is at the start, and this is in the first phase before the, the second turn in all of the emergency response you're doing. Uh, you, in essence, are composting around carcasses which are anaerobic microzones. And so the majority of the nutrients that reside in the carcasses themselves are unavailable to the compost microflora until the soft tissue is de decomposed enough and exposed enough uh, that it can become part of the diet of these microbes. 
And so the initial compost that's in the core that's wrapped around or laid around these carcasses needs to work by itself. And so some of the historical composting literature, oftentimes they laid clean sawdust around these intact carcasses, these microzones. And it took much, much longer to become active uh, because of that, because the sawdust did not have those microflora populations uh, to decompose that material, nor decompose those carcasses. And so uh, we're looking to have a material around the, the carcasses that works by itself. And, and so uh, that's the approach to we've taken in building the piles as well as putting the blend of materials together. And I'll, I'm gonna share that with you um, now. And so um, I already mentioned some of the shortcomings about using the art of composting. And uh, um, now I've sought to, uh, with collaboration, put together some tools that capture the science of composting. Historically, uh, these reasonable range conditions for active composting have been proven true. Uh, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 to one to, to 40 to one um, in that material, in this core material around these carcasses, a moisture content of 40 to 65%, we get outside of that range and we have uh, of both those ranges, then we have those challenges. Um, pH is really very forgiving, um, 5.590. And the bulk density is not as critical unless you get much heavier than this, much heavier because that reflects a loss of porosity and a limitation on the amount of oxygen present. Um, and that oxygen um, runs out quicker. Um, in that pile, how quickly that runs out given these bulk densities um, of materials. Um, when you search the scientific literature, there's not a lot to suggest that uh, that 1,500 pounds per cubic yard um, is only associated with 10 days of activity, for example. Uh, we don't have those numbers. And so when we started to require 14 days of activity and a 21 day turn in this process, um, we don't have a complete understanding of bulk density's relationship to that time. And so uh, it's a guess at this point. And so we say that we want a bulk density of uh, a thousand or less. And you go back to our method one, of determining clean amendment and determining the ratio, the relationship to tissue. Uh, recall that it's based on a bulk density of 800 pounds per cubic yard or 30 pounds per cubic foot. And so we're less than this recommendation. Can we get too fluffy? In other words, down to 600 pounds per cubic yard? Yes, and that could be then a cause for the pile never heating up because it's too porous and it's not holding heat. Do we have a good set of data to show where that line, where that really falls off? No, it's again, it's based on our best estimate and experiences that the SMEs that have been involved in have used over the course of time. So these guidelines are um, uh, conditions or constraints. Um, the two on top, the carbon and nitrogen ratio and the moisture content, I think are more important and uh, the focus uh, needs to be on them. So now on to, um, I'd like to talk first of all about the emergency planner. And I'm gonna open that up for us. I apologize that I just I hung up. Dale, I can still hear you. You can hear me. I uh, just locked up my computer. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just dialed that in. That always so happens. That... Um, 
Dee. And Dale, this is Lori. We can still see you on your uh, webcam, but we just yeah. don't see any PowerPoint. Yeah, and what I see on my computer is the last slide I left you with, and I wanted to move to the spreadsheet. I, bear with me. Apologize, hit the wrong icon. Okay. okay. Now can you see the screen, which is a spreadsheet? Not, not yet. You might have to share your screen. Okay. Thank you, Arlene. Here we go. Okay. Now can you? Now. Very yes. good. So this is uh, the emergency planner. And um, in the past uh, couple of months, we've done some work uh, to update it. And I'm going to walk you through it uh, and highlight the updates and how it can be used to uh, estimate uh, the amount of clean amendment that would be uh, for a situation, uh, a farm. On the right, I've got this version of the spreadsheet opened up so you can see what's in the background, but we're not gonna dwell on that. What I'd like to do is just show you how it operates. And uh, so I'm going to um, just enlarge it and go to the top. So here we are. And so at the top, you can enter in the farm name uh, and address and so forth. Um, and the reason you can do that is because you can print it out later and hand it to a farm. I use this in helping farms prepare. Uh, we're using this in Michigan to uh, work with uh, our farms and help them do the estimates um, of what would it take to respond to uh, um, uh, the disease, high path avian influenza, if it were to happen. Um, so I've got it right now for poultry, but you can see we can use it for swine responses, bovine, preparation of equine, small ruminants. Uh, you can select the species of mortality. You can have multiple species. You can select more than one. Uh, and uh, so it allows that flexibility. Um, you can select the use of windrows or bends. Um, in the case of uh, some of the cattle farms we've talked to in the state of Michigan, there are a number of very large bunker silos that sit empty uh, that would be used um, uh, in the case of a response. And so um, we put that in as a Ben option. Um, but what I want to show you today is just windrows in, our, in the context of your work with poultry. And so um, as you scroll down, you're given options in the green, light green, to enter in information. And so the first scenario I just wanted to walk through is um, just a, a 4,500 uh, bird um, turkey building, of five, uh, 50 by 500 feet. Um, they were 40 pounders at the end. And uh, so um, it uh, calculates the amount of mortality as 180,000 pounds. And uh, this totals it. If you had others on that farm site, uh, I've worked with uh, um, turkey sites where we had the brooder barns, we had poults. Um, in the case of that low path response we did in 14. Um, so it, it will allow you to do um, some addition of what might be on the site. Um, and uh, then it comes down here to a section in, uh, called mortality to amendment relationships. And you can see that um, here, as well as what I mentioned before, what's in the 
uh, is this volume factor or volume coefficient or mortality to volume relationship. And this, as, as interesting as, uh, or, um, as kind of vague as it may seem initially, is one of the most critical factors in animal mortil mortality composting historically. And it goes way back uh, to when poultry composting began in the 70s and 80s, um, whether that was uh, Eastern, Maryland, Delaware, um, and then it moved uh, east um, to Ohio. And um, it was there that uh, Dr. Harold Keener, who some of you have met, um, have read, um, was the first in, in the year 2000, but it was in 1995 when they started to put uh, um, some of the guidelines together in Ohio, that Dr. Keener um, suggested a, a, a volume coefficient or bulking agent to mortality ratio of uh, five pounds per cubic foot, five pounds per cubic foot. And in his 2000 article that he wrote, he suggested that when you got away from that too low or too high, you, re you encountered the problems. So I recall, and I send you back to um, our poultry one where we're talking about 20 pounds per cubic foot and uh, draw that to your attention, your memory again. Notice in this comment, and I pulled up the comment that I put in ours, um, that um, composting has successfully, you can look in the literature and you can find these coefficient or this density anywhere from all the way down to one pound per cubic foot up to 15 or 20 even. Um, however, when greater than 10 pounds per cubic foot, some of the literature would say intensive aeration, moisture management is necessary. You're getting more moisture and more nitrogen in these uh, piles. Okay, is there a great deal of science other than Dr. Keener's paper? The answer is no. And so a lot of this, again, is going based on the experiences of those of us that have done composting in our careers. And so the choice of a amount or a tissue density is, um, is one that in guiding this process that we have to make. Um, I know that, uh, I, I don't know if Jean uh, is on, but Cornell in their 2014-15 publication chose to use five pounds per cubic foot as their beginning guidance tissue density, uh, density factor. Um, and uh, um, I know that, uh, as I said, the Ohio State work, Dr. Keener and his recommendations, uh, Dr. Fulhag at, in Missouri, when I've looked at his recommendations, have been in that five foot. So when we respond in these emergency situations and we are pushed by the amount of mortality in a building and um, the size of the building, and the amendments available, we push ourselves up to 20 pounds per cubic foot. We are on that upper edge um, where others have cautioned that that's when we encounter the ammonia problems, that's when we encounter the uh, uh, moisture problems uh, that may come from that kind of a density. And once again, recall that we really got a lot of anaerobic microzones inside this core. And so when we go, greater than five pounds, it just means we have a lot more anaerobic area in the core of the pile because of the presence of these whole animals. So what our spreadsheet then does is it takes the total weight of mortality, 180,000 pounds, and just divides by five pounds per cubic foot. It gives you a core volume in that windrow of some 36,000 cubic feet. In this spreadsheet, we correct for the volume of the carcasses based on a density per pound of carcass. That, that uh, um, figure, uh, those figures for birds, for cattle, for hogs, uh, come from the body composition literature. Um, and so um, we want to know what volume is displaced by the presence of these whole carcasses. Um, so then we can calculate an appropriate volume of core amendments that would be needed uh, to compost these birds. And so we need from someplace 
uh, one about 1,100 cubic yards to compost the 4,540 pound birds on this farm. And so uh, it right away gives us that estimate. We select what size windrow width we'd like to use, and we can change that to 15, um, a height of six feet. Um, we select the amount of working space around each one of those windrows. This would be around the entire windrow. We know that we don't drive on both sides of the windrow in some of the turkey barns where we've responded. You may drive down the center. Uh, you might have turning equipment that's pull type, or you might be using a small skid steer. Um, so this is, you're free to estimate the average working space around a windrow. And uh, so those are just the dimensions of the windrow that you're working with. Um, and so given those dimensions, this program immediately tells us that one windrow, if it was one continuous length, uh, would be some 708 feet long and 31, um, the pad would be 31 feet wide. And so that's... Uh, the 15 plus 8 on one side and 8 on the other side equals 31. That's a simple calculation. But then if we know that the one foot base depth, we want clean material and we want a half a foot on the cap, and we can change this to a foot. Then the program calculates the volume of clean material for the entire cap to cover this windrow of some 653 cubic yards. Um, the a uh, windrow base is some 471 cubic yards, and then the core volume of uh, being animal and core amendments together, um, our total volume then now is about 2,458 materials. So now I know um, what I've got initially, some 1, uh, 1,120 cubic yards of clean material to begin with. Now what the program allows you to do is um, take the litter bedding pack that might be on a farm. And let's say that in this case, um, there's about uh, three quarters of a nine inches of litter. We can just say uh, three quarters of a foot. Um, we've got feed on hand. Uh, we've got a bulk density for that feed if it's a pelleted feed. Um, if there was manure elsewhere on the farm in case of a laying farm, uh, we would include that in the composting and then the bulk density of the, the manure that's on hand, the pack. Um, the building uh, length, 500 by 50. And it tells us that uh, um, we then have um, uh, uh, the um, amount of uh, manure, um, looking here, um, um, Additional amendment needed for the windrow core uh, needs to be brought in from offsite. This does not consider the compost recipe. Um, but what it's saying is that we've got a substantial amount of litter. And so the additional amendment just comes down to 164 cubic yards. Um, and so then this total here is the cap, the base, and this small amount that's needed for the core. We're going to use this litter uh, to make up the principal amount of the core. We have to, uh, given the emergency response. So my initial question then becomes, is this 164 of clean material in the core mixed with all of the litter on site a good recipe? We're forced to use that recipe, but is it a good one? And can we assess whether we're going to encounter problems more before we even start? Uh, because of the need to use this, this uh, litter um, that's present on the farm. And so um, pause there. What the rest of the spreadsheet does for this situation is it says we're going to use two wind rows in this building. The, there's gonna be a potential length of 484 feet. And so what the program then did was corrected cap volume and base volume for two wind rows versus one. And uh, so that's in here. And it says that uh, we've got enough space in this building to compost uh, all 4,500 birds, uh, the percent of the mortality. Um, it says, oh, I, I take that back. At 484 feet, uh, we can compost 93%. Uh, and that's because it's putting um, the working area around the uh, pile. 
um, on the ends. We wanted to do this and just say we average seven feet around there. Um, you'll see that our numbers change and we now have 98% of our birds composted. And I'm moving kind of quickly. I'm, I'm afraid I'm losing a few of you at this point. What I want to point out is that this program will tell you um, how much of the mortality you can successfully compost in this space given. And this would be in-house, a 500 by a 50 foot building. And so um, all I was doing was adjusting the working space, um, the average on the all three sides of the windrows. So that's three aisles, so to speak, that's 21 foot. If I put that down the center um, and none on the sides, I could make this smaller yet, this average working space. To remember to do this and to learn how to do this and do this each time would take some practice. And so um, there is a learning curve with the spreadsheet. Um, I don't think it's too steep. I think uh, um, with the comments that are there um, that would guide you uh, to make those decisions of uh, doing that in-house. So um, that's a one through once through with a turkey example. Are there any questions at this point? Anybody like to stop and ask me? Hi, Dale. This is Lori Miller. Yes. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, one question. There is um, a section of the spreadsheet that talks about the volume of material, the cap volume and um, you know the base volume, I think. I, I don't see it on the screen right now. But um, my question was, in the construction industry, so for example, if we're ordering um, fill dirt, it was often a problem to order it by cubic yard because then the um, you know unscrupulous contractors would fluff it up and you know sell you less mm -hmm. per cubic yard and so we moved to a weight based um purchasing a arrangement so that you know we would order a certain number of tons as opposed to yards um have you considered that issue with the carbon source and i could see where if we you know similarly unscrupulous vendors could add water with the weight based um, approach. So I just wondered if you had um, encountered this, thought about it, and what your th thoughts are. Good question, Lori. Um, yes, we have encountered that, and um, um, we have plans, you'll see down here, and we haven't got it developed yet, um, a report. Um, and in that report, we were going to give you the cap as, in a volume and in a weight basis with an assumption that the material weighed 800 or you know, the bulk density of that material ha would have to be known. Um, but yes, we had talked about doing it both ways. I don't have it in the spreadsheet yet, but Thank understood you. Thank that, you. yeah. And, and down here, we, we know that oftentimes feed is comes in, you know, what we we're told we have on the farm is on a ton basis. We're told that manure residing elsewhere in a stacking facility could be some 100 tons. Um, farms will probably know that as equally as readily as cubic yards. And so that conversion back and forth is something we plan to build into the spreadsheet. And um, have you had any experience with um, questionable vendors who try to you know, pad the loads? And do you think that it's better to order the um, carbon material in tons or in cubic yards? I think what you encountered is unavoidable. Um, there's always that, uh, that possibility that they add water or fluff the material if you're buying it on volume or buying it on weight. Um, that's always a possibility. Um, I suppose buyer beware. Um, and so if you can have and what we, you're, I'm going to jump way ahead. What we're working with here in Michigan is um, a couple of our uh, wood manufacturing, whether that be paper or um, OSB manufacturing. We've got some large piles of materials that have been stored outside 
um, that would be available in an emergency response. And we we ask them for a you know a printout of the material, and it comes to us as 50% moisture. That's what we're told, and that's what we're going to go on. Um, but when it begins to arrive, um, unless we do another assessment, um, which we should do, we only can go in what they told us. Okay, that's thank you. Um, I, I guess. Oh. oh, go ahead. Good. Um, it can be a pretty hard thing to do that. Um, to actually add, I mean, most of the compost industry runs by yards, and they do that because there's such large differential in there, and I think it wouldn't be any more accurate. I mean, you're just like, as Dale was saying, I think we have to check the load, you know, but then it's too late because we have it on site and, and we've paid for it generally also. Um, but I think it will be hard, even if we do it. And I don't, I don't discourage Dale from doing that at all. But I, I don't know if it's going to be more accurate. Oh, thanks for Hi, that, Jean. Is... I, I'm just thinking that we have that carbon um, material guideline job aid um, <clears throat> with our composting protocol, and I'm not sure if we have a moisture content test. Um, in there. And so if we don't, we should probably add one. And then folks can check the load and turn it away if it doesn't meet those criteria. Uh, I, and go ahead, Doris. Yeah, this is that's exactly where I was going is this is a contracting issue as much as a um, uh, as much as a production issue for the composting. And one of the thoughts that I've had is that no, you don't do it at the farm, but you have a pre-entry inspection point that's in proximity to the farm, but the trucks can pull safely out where someone can inspect it so that the material that doesn't meet contract specifications can be turned away before complicating the site and then make sure you document what you're turning away because they're going to be upset at being rejected. Thank you. Good points. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I think pre-entry inspection at a remote point, you know, not more than a half mile away necessarily, is critical to not complicating the traffic flow on the site, thus rejecting a load potentially, or having a load come on and then you have to deal with it. And so when you're assessing the site, I would also assess if there's a pre-entry staging area for these materials as well as other things before they get into the traffic around the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, Dale, can you hear me? That yes. Yep. yep. Well, very well put, Doris. Um, what we did in Nebraska, because they used the uh, the barcoding on all drivers and uh, especially the truckers, is they brought them into the emergency operations yard because we were at a agricultural center. We had about 15 acres of gravel so that we could swing trucks in, um, tell them where they were going, provide them guidance, and also take a look at the, the loads pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and anybody that's tried to add water to uh, a wood mix going into a compost pile will find out that about ninety percent rolls off anyway. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We've we've always used yards because that's the that's how they measure the buckets at the, the loading site and also the size of the trucks. Um, and, and that's just the, the weight's always under what the, 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 the trailer can haul. So, and I have one, oh, I have one comment, Dale, when you mentioned about composting cattle in horizontal bunks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was there, yeah. any, was there any concern about uh, potentially contaminating that bunk with uh, SRM because you're, Composting whole cattle. That did not come up, and I suppose that 
the assumption, and I, I say that, was that the cattle were not infected. Now, um, preferably, I'm getting a little echo, but that, that's, uh, preferably we use a, a manure pad, a constructed uh, manure storage unit. Um, but in emergency planning, they've taken a look at the potential of using those bunks. They are um, vacated bunks. In most cases, they're not being used. And uh, so that's a good question. What would happen if someone came five years later and said they wanted to start using them for feed again? I don't know, Edward. Well, no, well put. And, it, and not only just with infected cattle, um, the, the SRM regulations, uh, specific risk material are, are quite clear as to, uh, you know, uh, potential contamination going forward. So I, I think it just needs to be part of the discussion that it might be a short term gain, but it might uh, it makes decisions down the road having to be made. Very tough ones. Uh, and yeah, and we've yeah. Used, uh, used them before in New York also, and I would, I, we didn't weren't using them for disease either, um, but I would assume that we can disinfect those also. They're cement bunkers in our cases. Correct. Yeah. So I think I don't know the other others on the phone would have to indicate that that was true, but I think we could disinfect. That would be probably an FDA call. Um, because they manage in the United States animal feeds and SRMs. Mm -hmm. um, this is Dean Ross. You folks were talking about the need to check uh, moisture levels and do some calculations on, on bulk density and that sort of thing when feeds are delivered. Dale hasn't got there yet to talk about recipe and the importance of being able to have your composting amendments um, uh, compost themselves without the the animal uh, present, without the carcass present. Um, so one of the things you may find that you would need to do, particularly on a larger scale event, is create mixing yard, which is where you'd be doing all this checking so that there would be a, sec a primary dump uh, then you'd be mixing your materials and uh, together and then sending it out to your uh, farms uh, as they need it and also be able to have a variety of different compostables mixed together in a useful volume. Whereas if you're buying single source, like for instance, corn stalks um, was not necessarily the ideal way to go in terms of composting. It would have been better if it had been corn stalks and something else uh, with creating a recipe that will work for it. I can, um, what I'd like to do is. Um, Go back. Um, go back to and and show you just one more scenario um, with this tool, um, if, rather than go to the optimizer, the compost. But if we were just to use, let's say, 300,000 um, laying hens at four and a half. Oops, got 30,000. Um, and it would be a laying hen site. Um, it gives us that volume, um, again, using five. And I didn't do this, but if I were to, uh, I'm, I'm going to do it with five first, and then I'll come back and do it with 20 and just show you the ramifications of that on the volume of carcasses and the volume of amendments. So you see some 8,300 cubic yards of core amendments needed correcting for the volume of carcasses. If we use 15 foot wind rows that are six foot high, and now we'd probably be outdoors, you can go with a working space of at least 10 feet. You can go 20 feet if you'd like to around these, these uh, wind rows. 
we'll leave our base depth and our cap depth the same for now. Um, and you see that uh, for a 300,000 uh, bird site, um, we're getting into some figures, which some of you have dealt with even bigger when you get to 3 million birds. Um, but the compost core volume, the cap, the base, and then the total again. Um, in this situation, then we can change this, that we, we have no litter in the building. Um, we might have uh, uh, close to 50 ton of feed on hand. Um, and we might have, let's say, uh, 300 ton of manure stored in a stacking facility. And uh, we can give that a bulk density of something heavier, uh, possibly. Um, and so uh, then what this does is um, it, it projects the, the amount of clean amendment, uh, just given that we have that 1,000 cubic yards of manure. Uh, in this case, we've got uh, some 14,000 of clean amendment that must be uh, brought in. Going back up to here, we see it be one wind row of uh, 6,320 feet long eight acres out there on the site uh, is what's needed. And then we can come down here and we can start to look at various dimensions. Let's say that the farmer says they have 700 uh, uh, feet, but if they had a um, something that was uh, 700 by, uh, let's just say a square lot out there, um, we can see that we have 490,000 square feet of area available. Um, we could compost all those three times that number of birds on this site. And so it right away does a quick assessment if the farm says I have a, a couple of different uh, places I could go with this. Um, but you see that it's on that site, we're using six wind rows. And so the program will multiply um, the cap and the base um, volumes. Uh, it will determine the volume of material needed for that number of wind rows. It's not just the one uh, that's indicated here. I do this because it quickly tells me if I had one wind row that long, it'd be eight acres. Now I got to look for an eight acre site that has dimensions where that all fits in. So um, that's how we've used it um, here um, in Michigan, working with farms to prepare uh, their plans, emergency response plans, um, and determining that amount again of amendment. So. Uh, that's an, a layer example. I wanted to run that uh, through with you as well. So that's the, the emergency planner. Um, and uh, um, I know it's uh, nearly an hour. Um, I want to respect time. If you would like me to show you the optimizer, I can, or I can come back another time and, and uh, not spend this much time on the optimizer because I think we could uh, explain it and um, a shorter period of time, but uh, and just look at the relationships of these amendments to one another and how um, getting an appropriate mix in that core um, is possible. Thank you. No, th Arlene? Thank you. No, that was really, yeah, I think um, it probably, maybe we'll have a second, uh, you know, a second webinar with the optimizer and okay. um, and then can focus on that but thank you no that was really good and and um a really valuable tool so i think and, the, um, arlene i apologize the message I I, oh no. I I think that is most challenging is this is um really realizing the importance of this animal dish oh that's what i didn't do um the animal tissue dens density factor could i show you that real quick once again I've, since I've got this up. So if we take this layer of 3,000, recall that it took eight acres there. If you just change that to 20, like is currently recommended, you can see that we now um, went down to 2.1 acres. And uh, we are down to um, fewer wind rows. You can get it done in two wind rows. Um, but you can see that we get a negative value here, and it says that we don't have, um, we've got too much manure on hand if we go with that animal density. It's right away cautioning us that that is too dense 
given that you're going to do it, you've got to use all that manure that was on hand. Um, so the message I'd leave you with is that this is a very critical determinant um, in the methods we're suggesting to farms and respondents, um, given that there are the constraints of materials on farm. I apologize, Arlene, I wanted to just share that. No, that's no, that's good to include that. So I, I guess if we have just in the net, in the few minutes we have left, if wanted to see if there was anyone who had been in the in the response in Tennessee and Georgia or Alabama about some of the disposal that they're doing there, or they might still be there. So so we'll maybe next um. Next time we'll, you know, see if we have an update on that and some of the other the natural disasters that have been happening, like some of the wildfires also. Um, so I guess we're all, almost out of time, but but um, want to thank uh, Dr. Roseboom. That was really good, really valuable to know how to use that tool. And um, and so we we'd been thinking about while we have active active outbreaks and things going on of having a uh, a call maybe every two weeks and and having having the call mostly discussion like the you know just have a webinar inter, intermittently so maybe um so maybe in two weeks scheduling another call and um finishing up having um dr Roseboom cover the the optimizer part of the spreadsheet and then um have a discussion on um, on the ongoing um disposal that on the current outbreak in the southeast. So, so any um, any comments or questions? Yeah, this is Gary. Oh. I, I do like to have okay. the opportunity for that discussion. So, I think that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll go ahead and we'll schedule another call in in two weeks. I guess if the on the Wednesday morning, same time, if that works for people. And um, and I'll, I'll make sure, um, we'll see if, the, I guess that Dr. Roosevelt, we'll make sure he's available for the, um, for the second part, but then we'll have discussion on the other part of the call. And Arlene, this is Gary, can I say one more thing? Sure, go ahead. Okay, just wanted to let everyone know that we have been trying to work through the broiler breeder composting in-house issue, and we know that Edward has had some success with that, and we've been trying to, to work out a time to do a demo here in the U.S., and Josh Payne has been trying to get one done more in the South uh, with the AI outbreak that didn't happen. We've been having discussions here in Virginia over the last two years, and finally, we got something pulled together this week, so earlier this week, we were in the process of doing a demonstration where we depopped a broiler breeder house, and yesterday we completed the composting of all of those birds within that broiler breeder house, and that's something I can share on a little bit more at a, on a subsequent call. Yeah, that would be great. So I guess... I guess we'll I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up today's call, but thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Dr. Roseboom, and we'll plan on meeting again in two weeks then. My pleasure. Thank you, Arlene. Thank, thank you, Arlene. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.